When typically people think of a coral reef, they think of really clear water, really, really bright colors and huge coral colonies and really high visibility so you can see really far. Um, this is not like that. This is New England where it's sort of darker, murkier waters. And the visibility, if we're lucky, will be about 10 feet. And I have been diving there where you can barely see your hand in front of your face. My name is Randy Rogen. I am a research assistant professor here at the Department of Biology at Boston University. One of the things that I work on is this really cool coral called Astrangia paculata. It's also called the Northern Star Coral. There's a couple places where these corals live in abundance, where it's essentially a coral reef in New England. You can find granite walls that are just covered, I mean, covered, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting of these corals, and they're beautiful. Corals everywhere are in trouble. The estimates range between 60 and 75 percent of coral reefs in the world are threatened. Today, government scientists sounded the alarm about coral. Coral bleaching has become a major concern in a warming climate. For the second year in a row, Australia's Great Barrier Reef has fallen victim to mass bleaching. Corals around the world, when they're suffering from a variety of stressors, are bleaching. They turn white. Bleaching is the first sign of stress, and it often, but not always, leads to mortality. So in order to explain that, let me, let me try to tell you how a coral works a little bit. A good friend of mine likes to say that corals are sea monsters because they're animals, vegetables, and minerals all rolled into one. The animal is the coral itself, the mineral is the calcium carbonate skeleton that it builds, and the vegetable is the tiny plant-like symbiont that it partners with called dinoflagellate, which actually photosynthesizes just the way plants do. The symbionts provide the vast majority of the color in corals, and they use sunlight's energy to fix carbon to enable corals to build a calcium carbonate skeleton, which is how reefs get built, you know, really on the backs of this relationship. But when corals are stressed, that relationship between the coral and the symbiont breaks down. These corals are living in a pretty narrow temperature band, and when you exceed that, it really starts to hurt them. They bleach, meaning they lose their symbionts. The coral appears white because the skeleton underneath them is white. Their symbionts are no longer fixing carbon from sunlight, so they're no longer providing that energy to the corals. And it starts this clock ticking, where corals only have a limited amount of tissue left in them they can use for energy reserves. And when that energy burns out, they die. So this is a strange apoculata. There are three corals in this dish, and one of them is white, and one of them is chocolatey brown, and one of them is kind of in between. And none of them are stressed right now. I mean, they might be a little stressed, they're on camera. <laughs> but what makes a strange so special is that it can live perfectly happily without its symbionts. It's bleached without being stressed. It's not the only coral that does this, but there are very few corals that do. And one of the things that my lab is doing is really trying to understand what a symbiont really does, trying to really get to the true nature of symbiosis. Welcome to the lab. It's a bit crazy and busy and chaotic, but in this lab, we are starting to really try to understand one of the greatest mysteries of coral biology, in my opinion, which is how this little coral, um, a strange apoculata, which you'll see right here in these tanks, manages its symbiotic relationship. So what's great about this coral is we can take it from the field, we can bring it to the lab, and it can live happily in our laboratory, and we can manipulate all kinds of really interesting things. For example, if we want to understand how important food is to this coral, we can feed them a lot, and we can feed them by hand, or we can starve them. And so we can manipulate their diet and their dietary components and the amount of food and the quality of their food. If we're trying to pay attention to what's happening to the symbiont, we can manipulate light. So we can put them in the dark, we can put them in the light, and anywhere in between, we can alter wavelengths. And so we can bias the lab environment towards a happy symbiont or a happy host or a happy holobiont, which is the two of them together. And then we can look to see how a coral responds. And it's just a fascinating evolutionary puzzle to try to solve. 
corals as a group, some of them live in the deep sea, some of them have been alive for thousands of years and are still living today. That's amazing. And to try to understand their mysteries, their mechanisms of what really makes them tick, what really metabolically gives them the ability to withstand all of these different environmental situations, I mean, that's a mystery worth solving, right?